Good morning. So aujourd'hui, bienvenue. So it's um, it's like first day back at school. Uh, it's uh, it's actually, believe it or not, good to be back. Um, je m'appelle Elizabeth May, chef de Parti Vert de Canada, avec moi. Mon collègue et autre député vert, Mike Morris, l'honorable député de Kitchener Centre. We wanted to highlight the things that we'll be pursuing in the fall session of Parliament. There are many. Uh, I'll briefly set out a couple, pass it over to Mike, and then we're open for any questions you may have. Nous sommes disponibles pour les questions en anglais ou en français. Climate. 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 We've had another summer of loss of property, devastating forest fires, uh, heat domes, flooding. It's become, I hate to say it's almost expected that we look at summer and think, oh, here comes forest fire season, here comes smoke. We're not prepared. It's draining provincial budgets, British Columbia in particular, the amount of money spent billions of dollars of repairs to infrastructure ongoing from the atmospheric rivers of fall 2021. We want to see action on climate. This Friday, some of the amendments that I'll be putting forward at third reading on Bill C-33 to accelerate the moment that we follow through on a Liberal campaign promise to ban the export of thermal coal. These are amendments I'll be bringing forward to Bill C-33. Bill C-33 is a bill I really want to see all the way through the House and the Senate before an election. It's a bill that was put forward when the Minister of Transportation was Omar al Gabra. It's been around for a while. It deals with rail safety and restrictions on the powers of port authorities that are a big issue in my community and in my riding. We also want to see action on climate to deal with the excess profits that the oil and gas industry is receiving. I also want to stay on top of the implementation of my private member's bill that was signed into law with Royal Assent June 20th of this year, which is to see a, a, a really robust plan for achieving environmental justice. I will also continue to track the work of the um, Hogue Commission and my own work as one of the only, well, I shouldn't say one of the only leaders, the only leader uh, who doesn't want to get top secret security clearances, apparently Mr. Poilev, but having had access to it, I will continue pursuing the issue of foreign interference in the parliament and as ever pursuing any opportunity to get uh, proportional representation, fair voting back on the agenda before whenever the next election may be. And now over to Mike. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, wonderful to see you all. Um, for my part, spent most of the summer knocking on doors in my community, spoke, uh, knocked on over 4,500 doors, and across the board, it continues to be the case that the rising cost of living and the unaffordability of day-to-day -day life uh, continues to be top of mind for so many folks in my community and across the country. We need to continue to address the housing crisis that we're in, if we're going to be honest about addressing affordability. As Greens, we're going to continue to call for predictable, ongoing investments in deeply affordable housing, as well as the actions that need to be taken to prevent pension funds and real estate investment trusts and other large corporate investors from buying up housing and raising rents on regular folks. Um, in my community, in particular, temporary uh, residents, the rise this federal government has not been um, watching the numbers. In our community, uh, a local college has raised the number of uh, international students from 700 to over 31,000. The federal government was asleep at the switch over the past year. We worked with the um, a Minister of, Immig of Immigration to put a number of measures in place. I'll be continuing to advocate for reasonable measures that ensure we prevent the exploitation of international students, but also ensure that the numbers are more in line with uh, community infrastructure from housing to healthcare to employment. You, you heard Elizabeth mention Motion 92. As Greens, we're going to continue to call. If we're going to be honest about addressing affordability, we need to address the gouging that oil and gas companies are doing. They're making record-breaking profits on the backs of regular Canadians. It is so disappointing that we haven't seen a windfall tax placed on the oil and gas industry the way this government already did on life insurance and banks in the midst of the pandemic. If we did so, we could raise $4.2 billion, every dollar of which could go back into making life more affordable for folks across the country. We could be improving service and reducing fares on public transit, for example. We could be helping Canadians retrofit their homes and getting heat pumps installed across the country. 
As Greens, we're going to also continue to call for the government to follow through on promises made in recent years. That includes promises made to communities like mine to build two-way, all-day GO train service from Kitchener to Toronto. My community's been promised that for over 10 years. We don't even have a date for completion yet. This government should be calling for accountability from provinces and and territories to follow through on important community promises like that one. I'm going to be continuing to advocate for funding for the arts. Uh, Elizabeth and I both have been working across party lines in recent months to ensure there's better geographic distribution of funds. Communities like mine are getting $3 a person while others are getting upwards of $21 a person. It adds up to a $9 million shortfall and artists and, and creatives and arts organizations in my communities and others are hurting as, as a result. We need to see fair distribution. Finally, no doubt, Greens are going to continue to call for the federal government to fix the Canada Disability Benefit. They promised and they raised the hopes of folks with disabilities across the country when they promised the supplement that would lift hundreds of thousands of working age folks with disabilities above the poverty line. They disappointed the disability community uh, with their announcement uh, from the budget back in the spring. As Greens, we're going to continue to call for this government simply to follow through on what they promised and fix the Canada Disability Benefit. I'll pass it back to Elizabeth now for any questions. Merci. Thanks, Mike. And of course, because there's a British Columbia election as well, I've been knocking on a lot of doors too, and I just finished a round of nine community meetings in Saanich Gulf Islands. It's not a big geographical region when you look at it on a map, but I've got five small islands where transportation is difficult to get to meetings with their MP and so I hold five meetings on each of the islands in my riding and four locations on the peninsula. I never meet with constituents that we don't hear the top of mind issues you've just heard from Mike as well. Healthcare crisis, housing, inaccessibility, inaffordability and the Canada Disability Benefit questions across Canada that we hear no matter where we are because I've also been campaigning this summer in Winnipeg and Montreal people want to see that their government works for them and we are committed as Greens to have this Parliament work for Canadians and with that we're open to any questions you may have. Good morning. How does your party plan to approach non-confidence votes this sitting? One at a time. So uh, and we have not voted confidence in this government. We've not voted confidence in budgets, which are the true measure, uh, measurement of confidence in a government. Ever since the Liberals bought the Kinder Morgan pipeline, and then it's not to use the word waste is an understatement, but to spend thirty-four thousand million. I sometimes say it like that because I think billion just goes over people's head like another variation of million. But thirty-four thousand million hits home. $34 billion to build the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which is still opposed by sovereign First Nations governments along the route, opposed by my constituents, opposed by British Columbians, opposed by the government of Washington State. It's a dangerous project that the government backed fully with public dollars. So we haven't, as Greens, voted confidence in Trudeau's administration ever since that happened. Mr. Poiliev and, and this current round of, uh, I, I sometimes find it Shakespearean, you know, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. You have to be able to count, and there's the block seats plus the liberal seats, or in another iteration with a different vote, it could be the NDP votes with the liberal votes. Uh, Mr. Poiliev doesn't get an election. Uh, just because he has a slogan that rhymes, it, it doesn't add up to a responsible decision. So we might, you know, find ourselves voting non-confidence. But before we commit to what we're going to do with Mr. Poilievre's motion, we have to read it. And based on what you heard from Canadians over the summer, do you think that there should be a federal election this fall? No. I'll tell you why. Canadi- uh, what I hear from Canadians is that they t- they don't like stupidity. They don't like partisan politics for the sake of being hyper-partisan. It was under Stephen Harper that I think it was viewed universally as a good thing for Canadian democracy to have a fixed election date, to reduce the game playing around we're going to call a snap election, we've decided we want it. We know that governments and politicians look at the polls and decide this is our chance. Uh, John Horgan did it in BC, it's across party lines, he was NDP. 
Doug Ford does it in Ontario. Okay. But the fixed election date was put in place in order to provide certainty for things that really matter, like getting through a legislative agenda. The first prime minister to bring in the fixed election date was also the first prime minister to break it when Stephen Harper ignored his fixed election date for the 2008 election. We would like to see work done before throwing Canadians into a federal election. We have three provincial elections this fall. They're consequential. They elect provincial governments in Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and British Columbia. It certainly means that uh, a federal election is not realistically in the offing, at least uh, for 2024. What do you think of the NDP signaling a lack of support for the consumer carbon lobby? Uh, uh, the No Discernible Principles Party, NDP. What do they stand for? How could they, and both David Eby as Premier of British Columbia and Pierre Poiliev, it's fine for Pierre Poiliev to say he doesn't listen to, I mean, excuse me, Freudian slip. It's fine for Jagmeet Singh <laughs> to say he doesn't listen to Pierre Poiliev, but Pierre Poiliev's words come out Jagmeet Singh's mouth. So I'm, I mean, it's, I shouldn't be as appalled as I am. Twice in the last year, Mike and I have voted in favor of carbon pricing when we've watched every NDP MP stand up and vote with conservatives. That's already happened twice. But to announce that you're opposed to it, and then, and again, this is a big problem for the NDP because they're merged federally, top down, provincially. Greens aren't like that. Our parties are, we're provincial cousins across the country. We share the same values, but we don't operate top down in that sense. But it's been clear that we could never see uh, Mr. Singh speak out against the Trans Mountain Pipeline because it would have made the Alberta NDP angry. Uh, Mr. Singh won't speak out against a major source of greenhouse gases in fracking. Uh, fracking is, um, releases a, a lot of methane. It's a powerful greenhouse gas. But as long as the BC NDP are boosting greenhouse gases through fracking, you won't hear the federal NDP speak out against it. So we look at actions of leaders of parties based on have they read the science? Does it seem that they are concerned about the climate crisis? Uh, when we go door to door, certainly in my community in British Columbia, climate comes up a lot as a major concern. Uh, it may not be the, the, the flavor of the month in national polling. It doesn't mean that I don't hear every single day from Canadians who are very concerned that we're approaching tipping points in the atmosphere that threaten the survival of human civilization. These are not small stakes, and they should not be the kinds of issues where a person in with a responsible position as leader of a federal political party should not be influenced by polling to such an extent that they abandon all principle. No discernible principles, Mr. Singh. So do you agree with the conservative leader that Mr. Singh is a sellout? I do not agree with Pierre Poilievre's use of disrespectful slang and, and nasty nicknames. So I'm not going to go there. I think that Mr. Singh should be ashamed. They, the, uh, and Mr. Eby as well. A carbon price is a necessary but insufficient response to the climate emergency. We need to take bigger measures, and this Mike and Motion 91, it's very clear that since Putin invaded Ukraine, the fossil fuel industry has benefited from essentially war profiteering, profits off the charts. We need to make a, a real decision as a country whether we're serious about climate or not. So I challenge again, challenge Justin Trudeau. He announced in Paris in 2015, Canada is back. How is the Canada that Justin Trudeau brought back to global negotiations different from the Canada that was there under Stephen Harper? Canada's record remains the worst in the G7 for going in the wrong direction on climate action, increasing emissions when we should be decreasing. So I think, Mr. I don't think he said, the, the use of the term sellout is too close to Mr. Poiliev's quite um, unacceptable use of disrespectful nicknames. It's Trumpian, and I won't go there. Just yes, a brief of course. One, Elizabeth. Just a, a brief point to add that where we agree with the NDP is the massive handouts to the oil and gas industry. They're making tens of billions of dollars in profits 
And the federal government is still giving them $18 billion of our own money. As you heard from Elizabeth, we all spent $2,000 per household to expand the TMX pipeline in the midst of the climate crisis. So we agree more needs to be done to redirect those funds to regular Canadians. Where we vehemently disagree is that the reality is that, that the consumer carbon price continues to get more back to low-income Canadians than they pay. And that is true both when it comes to the rebate as compared to the bills of low-income folks who don't have a second cottage or a second car, but also with the minor inflationary effect of carbon pricing. Where we should be putting our time collectively is to call out that the carbon price went up two cents a litre last year, while the profits of the oil and gas industry went up 18 cents a litre. Shouldn't we all be united as progressives to be calling out that gouging and collectively putting pressure on the government to put in place a windfall profit tax as opposed to acquiescing to conservative talking points? That's certainly dis disappointing. And we'll take a question online. I have Mark Ramsey, Toronto Star. Please go ahead. I was with Mike. Thanks for uh, taking my question and hope you're both well. Uh, you mentioned that you, you're hearing from Canadians that they don't want an election this fall and you think, you know, politicians are looking at the polls and kind of deciding that way whether they want an election or not. For you guys, uh, you know, as far as I'm aware, you have about 18 candidates uh, nominated for the next election. Are you, do you think that you're ready for an election? Do you want an election? Yes. A lot of candidates that have completed the nomination process is, is a poor measurement of our preparedness because there are a large number of people who have other jobs, high-profile positions, and they don't announce their candidates till closer to writ period. I think there had been a widespread expectation that we were sticking to something very close to the fixed election date period. Uh, so the preparedness that we have is I, I'm very confident that we'll win a lot more seats in when 2025, which is when I think the next federal election will be, whether late fall, early fall, or late summer, we'll be ready. But thanks, Mark. Can I yeah, sure. Yeah, Mark, I think also what you heard from Elizabeth is different folks might have different perspectives on who wants a Canadian or who wants an election, who doesn't. I think what you heard from Elizabeth, though, is that as Greens, we're coming in here to continue to be focused on actually advancing priorities of the people we represent, as opposed to a lot of the partisan theatrics that have increased and we expect will continue to increase. And so more than anything, it might be more difficult over the coming months to get things done in spite of all the posturing. But we are arriving here uh, very much excited to continue to make progress on all that we heard from Canadians, both in my community and as you heard from Elizabeth across the country. Thank you both. And as a follow up, uh, you know, you mentioned the theatrics and earlier you were talking about Pierre Polyev's nicknames. Um, just to, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau the other day said on a podcast that Pierre Polyev was a liar. Earlier today, House Leader Karina Gould uh, called him a fraudster. What do you make of the Liberals' uh, attacks there? Do you, do you think that's appropriate? I think it's pretty clear from my record as a parliamentarian that I've worked and can, will continue to work to elevate the discourse in our parliament. I think as a Canadian and honoured to be a member of Parliament, I embrace nothing as firmly as I embrace the notion that in Canada we can disagree without being disagreeable. I think that's critical. I think Canadians, ex well, I think at this point what Canadians expect of politicians is a pretty low bar. But we can do better. We can stick to facts. We can talk about evidence-based decision-making. And on the evidence, when you connect the dots, Climate crisis causes inflation, particularly foods where crops fail because of extreme weather events. Things actually cost more when they're hit hard by supply chain disruptions, such as we're still experiencing post-COVID. But particularly if you connect the dots, extreme weather events that mean that a particular region of the world is not producing the food at the same price it was when they weren't dealing with extreme drought and floods and so on. So we need to be focused and deliver for Canadians, and I don't think name-calling advances that. 
just one quick question, just to uh, expand upon my colleague's uh, question earlier about uh, Mr. Singh's um, <clears throat> opposition to the carbon tax. Um, how do you react to his um, assertion saying that the car he opposes the carbon tax because it's an undue burden on working people? <clears throat> Again, I urge Mr. Singh to look at the evidence. That isn't backed up by the parliamentary budget office. It, is, it isn't backed up by leading economists. I want to be very clear that the Green Party of Canada has called for what we call with the, the, the different kinds of carbon taxes that are out there, we call carbon fee and dividend, which is there's a carbon price applied. It should be revenue neutral. In other words, the money received into a government from its carbon pricing should be used to reduce costs for Canadians, either through in, in the original British Columbia carbon price, which was a reduction in our income tax or through direct rebates, as the federal backstop now does, on the evidence, this is for, particularly for lower income Canadians, a net gain. So I, I again, it's, it's uh, look at the facts, and then if you're going to say you're going to get rid of a central piece of, basically the only thing the Liberals have done on climate, because they have poured, they did say they were going to stop subsidizing fossil fuels, they've poured billions into the pockets of big oil in fake solutions like carbon capture and storage and going in the wrong direction against the advice of the International Energy Agency and against the advice of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, this government has invested our public funds in expanding fossil fuel infrastructure, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. I urge Mr. Singh, Mr. Trudeau, Mr. Poiliev, look at the evidence and then if you're going to knock a particular strategy or policy, what's your alternative? And it, uh, I never thought I'd be reminded of Donald Trump and something Jagmeet Singh says. But when he's grabbling around and saying, well, we're going to give you a policy or a vision, we have a climate idea in mind, and, it, and Trump's saying we're going to have the concepts of a plan, we haven't, or Tim Wolf, get your homework done. I'd say the same thing to all my colleagues who are leaders of other parties. Do your homework before you tell Canadians we're going to get rid of something because we have some vague idea. This is urgent. It's not like anybody in this country in a position of responsibility as a leader of a federal political party can pretend they don't know that we're in a planetary climate crisis with the potential to wipe out human civilization. This is not a prediction. This is not doomsaying. I have an obligation as a political leader to say there's still time, there's hope, don't despair. But I hear from more Canadians who are despairing that it may be too late to preserve a future for their grandchildren than those who say, let's do nothing about it. I don't hear that. I don't hear anyone say, let's do nothing about it. I hear Canadians looking desperately for leadership and solutions. And fortunately, Greens have them. So in that sense, you know, sort of almost can't wait for an election to put forward solutions. But I'd rather achieve them in a parliament that works than put them forward for uh, another round of a very expensive federal election. In, in the meantime, I think what we have happening with carbon pricing is we have a liberal government that's been working cross pur purposes with itself for years with carbon pricing that actually does work to reduce emissions while, false, by, while subsidizing the very industry most responsible for the crisis makes it pretty easy for the Conservatives to go ahead and then try to scapegoat the carbon price. And that's why it's particularly disappointing seeing the messages from the NDP of late. As Greens, we're going to just continue to try to stick to both what can make life more affordable for folks across the country and, uh, and be serious about the urgency of the crisis that we're in. Foreign interference, uh, Ms. May, you have an opportunity this afternoon to make an intervention in NDP MP Jenny Kwan's privilege motion. Can you give us a sense of what you plan to say and how you plan to advance foreign interference this sitting? Well, I don't know that I'll have an opportunity to give a speech, but I'll certainly have an opportunity to ask questions, so I'll be listening very closely. I think I will continue to maintain that every party leader in the parliament should seek top secret security clearance. You don't get it as of right. And I would ask Mr. Poiliev, why are you not prepared to try to get top secret security clearance? Um, what page is it in? This is the public version. I always make sure I've got the public version in front of me, having had the opportunity to read the, the um, non-redacted version. But we do know from page 32 of the public version of the Committee on Parliamentary uh, Parliamentarians National Security and Intelligence Report that there was foreign interference in the Conservative Party leadership race. 
if I were Mr. Polyev, I'd want to know, am I beholden to a foreign government? What happened in the Conservative Party leadership race? That is something that, that I would ask Mr. Polyev. And any uncertainty about the extent of foreign interference in your own party, get ask for your top secret security clearance. And I know from going through it myself, it's an arduous process, and you don't get it by right. And the people who are in control of basically our agencies that are part of the Five Eyes, we want our allies to know that we take it seriously, that we take intelligence and security seriously in this country, that we want to close those loopholes that create the, the soft places that make Canada a particular target for foreign interference, and that we want to make sure that, that all of us as p federal political party leaders toughen up our own rules around nominations and leadership races. And again, it's, it's in the unredacted public version that there was a foreign interference in both India and uh, in the Conservative Party leadership race, there's al allegations of foreign actors from both the People's Republic of China and India in the Conservative Party of Canada leadership race. So Mr. Poiliev, uh, I, I find his unwillingness to pursue that worrying. Thanks, Olivia. Any more questions? That concludes this question. So nice to be back. Thanks again. Merci. A bientôt. Recording stopped.